has quite a nice mechanical way of protecting your recordings in the event of you forgetting to switch it back to play. So, in record, forward direction, you're recording. You've done your recording, you put it in stop, and you want to rewind it to play it back. Notice how this switch physically moves mechanically with the levers moving to rewind. So, forward, room record, stop. Of course, you can move it back to play before you rewind, but hey, in record, stop, rewind, play back. Nice. Test recording. This is a test recording on the Fuji Cherry FT104A battery operated tape recorder. This tape recorder is a single motor rim drive machine. It uses 3 inch reels and has swing magnet arrays with a variable speed pot. Test recording. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This is a test recording. Test recording. This is a test recording on the Fuji Cherry FT104A battery operated tape recorder. This tape recorder is a single motor rim drive machine. It uses 3 inch reels and has swing magnet arrays with a variable speed pot. Test recording. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This is a test recording. For the last five minutes of this video, we will be listening to an interview with Stan Laurel, recorded in 1959. Well, I was born in England, in Alverston, Lancashire, and uh, my family were a theatrical family, so I've been associated with the business since I was born. My parents were in the dramatic business. My dad wrote shows and produced shows and also had a circuit of theatres around the north of England. So I was born in Lancashire, but I was raised in several parts, in Durham, around the Tyneside, and finally up in Glasgow, Scotland, I received my, most of my education. Uh, well, I did start out very early. Uh, in fact, uh, my dad wanted me to be in the front of the theatre business. Uh, he'd been through a lot of hardships in his day. He had been with circuses and shows and what have you. So he, he felt it was a rough business for anybody and he would prefer that I did odd jobs around the theatre in Glasgow and other theatres uh, in the box office taking care of the programme, chocolate receipts and general uh, utilities, if I say. I first started appearing on the stage and uh, made appearance in some of the dramatic shows that appeared at the Metropole Theatre in Glasgow and uh, played little bits and parts of Newsboy or something, was just to break me in, as you might say. But uh, my dad wasn't too favorable of me doing it. But anyway, it was in my blood and I didn't have much education. It was my own fault, I had every chance, but I don't know, the spirit of the theater was in me and education didn't mean it. <laughs> it was more clever. <laughs> so anyway, I, I finally uh, broke out as a boy comedian, which was, was quite popular those days. There were several boy comedians doing very well. So I, I started out uh, in uh, the music halls as a boy comedian. I wasn't too successful, however, because I'd had no experience. 
didn't have any material of any kind. In fact, I hadn't found myself anywhere. Didn't know just what kind of a comic I was or anything else. But I was just happy to be in front of the footlights. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, my dad finally got me uh, a job in a pantomime, Christmas pantomime. It was a Sleeping Beauty. So from there, uh, oh, I tried a little bit of music halls again and. Then I went into a dramatic show, played a comedy part in it, and uh, that folded up. So uh, I finally drifted into uh, the Fred Carno Company. That was Carno's London Comedians. And uh, with the same outfit was Charlie Chaplin. We did a different show every week. We had a repertoire of shows, and including the one that uh, we flopped in. We'd all gotten together and really became a success. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, from there we went to the uh, American Theater in Chicago for us. We played there three weeks. Then we came back to the Plaza on Fifth Avenue in New York and we played there three weeks. Then we went to Philadelphia and we opened the new Nixon Nerdlinger Theater. And we played in Philadelphia for 12 weeks. And then we started out on the Southern and Constant Circuit. I was the second that came to the coast. So it was during that trip that Max Sennett saw Chaplin. For a couple of years after that, they were negotiating. And finally on the last trip, I think it was 1913, well, they played the, uh, the Carnot shows on the SSC time. Oh, for, I think they had three or four straight runs. They wasn't serious. You know, he, he loved to play. He, he didn't uh, hold much interest in the in the production of the picture. I never see him between pictures. We call up and say, "When do we start?" or "When do we sell?" So, so. <laughs> I I think uh, our success in that situation was due to the fact they were never mixed socially. There was never any jealousy between the team because of Babe's attitude that he. He left everything to me. He was very happy to know that he didn't have to be worried or have any, any responsibility at all. He wouldn't accept any responsibility. All oh, they were marvelous days. It was really delightful. Well, I just correspondence is about all I can do. The television correspondence, friends dropping in, little card game now and then. Well, I'm very happy and content. Uh, I've been very fortunate. Yes, a lot of happy men.